everybody, I'm Susan Mulvihill. Welcome back to our vegetable garden. So here we are into the first full week of September. And I have to say that this time of year, most vegetable gardens don't look all that great. And mine is in that category, <laughs> but it's doing okay. And I have some vegetables I get to harvest today and a few tips to share with you. Now, for those of you who are new to my videos, we live in Spokane, Washington and that is about 300 miles east of Seattle. So we're almost to the Idaho border. We are in hardiness zone 5B. And I have to tell you, we have had a season long drought. It has been absolutely awful. For the whole season, we had only gotten up to last week, a 10th of an inch of rain. That is bad. But the great news is for the last week, we have gotten quite a bit of rain and my rain gauge says we have gotten about an inch of rain, which is fabulous. So things are looking up. I'm pretty sure I've been hearing all the plants slurping up all that moisture because they've just been so dry for so long. Okay, let's see what kind of trouble we can get up to in the vegetable garden today. In this bed, I'm growing Bell Star broccoli. A colleague of mine recommended the variety very highly and I thought I've got to try it. So this is my first year of growing Bell Star. There are 11 plants in this three foot by eight foot raised bed. And I harvested the primary heads, which were huge, quite a few weeks ago. And then for a while, it was like the secondary heads or side shoots weren't developing. And I thought, well, that's a bummer because my friend was pointing out how large the side shoots are. Well. I needn't have worried because pretty soon they started sprouting and I have harvested quite a lot of side shoots from this bed. Well, believe it or not, it's time for me to harvest even more. So I wanted to show them to you because I think you will really be impressed. Now, one thing that I want to point out real quickly before I uncover this bed is that I'm growing the broccoli under something that's called agricultural insect netting. This is something that I purchased from a website that's called gardenport.com. And the idea is to prevent cabbage butterflies or cabbage moths, depending upon what you have in your area, from landing on the plants, laying eggs, which of course hatch into the caterpillars that have a voracious appetite for anything in the cabbage family. So that's what I have used. This is my second growing season of using agricultural insect netting. It works really, really well. Okay, so this is a side shoot. Look at that. I have never in all my years of growing broccoli harvested a side shoot that large. Here's another one. This one I think I'll let grow a little bit more. Another one. Another one. <laughs> Another one. So you get the general idea. This has been the most prolific variety of broccoli that I have ever grown. The broccoli is delicious. And in addition to having some with our meals, I'm also blanching and freezing it so that we can enjoy it all winter long. I have about eight heads more that are getting close to harvest size. I'm just going to let them go a little bit longer. The idea is to get them opening just a little bit, but not so much that they start blooming. So that's the timing of harvesting. But I am so impressed with this variety. And if you're wondering where I got the seeds, they came from high mowing organic seeds. Now they are a little more expensive than usual. And 
I have a tendency to balk at that. You know, you tend to see some new varieties coming out and you get a whopping 10 seeds for five bucks or something like that. And I think, gosh, that is way too expensive. But in the case of this, I would say the price was worth it. Now you are looking at the bean arbor bed, specifically on the north side. And that's where I always grow a small crop of celery. So that's what these plants are here. And you can see some yellow tinged leaves. I'm certain that is leaf scorch because it has been so hot and so dry here. But I wanted to pick a stalk for you so you can see what homegrown celery looks like. There's one. Isn't that a beauty? Now the reason I wanted to point out my celery crop to you is to recommend a specific variety. Now for years I used to grow tango celery because I heard that was great for growing in northern climates. And you know it was okay but it wasn't great. And this year I decided to try Utah Improved which is another one that's supposed to do well in our climate and I decided to go for it. And I am so glad I switched. The thing with celery is that a lot of people say, why in the world would you grow something that you can so easily buy in the grocery store? And so here's the scenario I always share with them. Let's say you want to make something that takes celery, like tuna fish sandwiches or something. And so you go to the store, you buy a head of celery, you take it home, you use it for a couple things, and then you forget about it. It's in your vegetable crisper in your refrigerator, and it's slowly but surely turning into a disgusting, rotting mess. <laughs> I've had that happen a lot over the years because I just tend to forget to use it. Well, the great thing with growing your own celery is that you just harvest what you need, use it, and the plants keep growing and producing stocks. Now, before we get a frost, I am going to harvest all of the stalks. I'll chop them up and put them in freezer bags and pop them in our freezer. So that way, if I'm going to make a kettle of soup or stew or a casserole and I want to add some celery to it, I've got it all ready to go. So that's why I grow celery. And I really, really like this variety, Utah Improved. Well, we just had a surprise rainstorm and I'm not complaining, but I had to go inside for a little while. The next thing I wanted to talk about today is winter squash and pumpkins. How in the world do you know when they're ripe? And how can you get them to keep in storage through the fall and winter months that you can enjoy them over a long period of time? So this kind of pumpkin looking thing here is actually a winter squash called autumn frost. Absolutely delicious when you roast it in the oven. This little orangey one here is called Poti Maron, another fabulous winter squash. I've been growing these two varieties for about maybe three or four years now and they never disappoint. So there's three things you want to look at when you're trying to decide if a winter squash or a pumpkin is ripe. The first thing is the color. Now, for this one, I know this is the right color. It's kind of a tan shade. And there's another one over here that still has a lot of green in it. So I know that one is not ripe. The next thing I do is I look at the stem. And I'll show you a close-up of that so you can see what I'm referring to. It shouldn't be a green stem anymore, like this one still has a lot of green on it. It should be more of a goldy brown color. And then the last thing you want to do is what I call the thumbnail test. And it doesn't have to be your thumbnail, but that's what I typically use. And I'll push my thumbnail into the squash as hard as I can or into a pumpkin. And if my fingernail does not cut through the skin, that means that it's ripe. So I'm taking those three things into account. Now my fingernail did not go through there, but this still looks pretty green. So I'm going to wait 
for harvesting them. Now here's a close-up on a New England pie pumpkin because I want to show you what I meant about the color of the stem. If you look at this one, it's turning color. It's kind of a goldy color, but I know that this stem needs to be more of a brown. So let me show you that. Now look at the stem on this one. See how that is completely brown? So what I would do, I know, first of all, the color is okay because it's a pumpkin. And then the next thing I would want to do is to press my thumbnail in there. And it's pretty good. I think they could go a little bit longer. Now here's a close up on that autumn frost squash again. The skin color is looking really good but this stem is still green. So it's still got nutrients coming into the squash and that means I want to wait to harvest it. Now when you're ready to harvest a winter squash or pumpkin, always leave a couple of inches of stem attached. That's because if you break it off on purpose when you're harvesting or accidentally, this area here has been opened up to developing mold and that is not a good thing because then it won't keep in storage for a long time. So keep it intact. Now, if you do knock it off accidentally, all that means is use that pumpkin or winter squash first. Now, what is my secret for getting winter squash and pumpkins to last a very long time in storage? you need to put them through what's called the curing period. That's a period of two weeks where you harvest them and you move them somewhere that's sheltered from the weather and that gets sunlight and is reasonably warm. So I usually put them in our greenhouse and do that for two weeks and then I can move them into storage. Now I realize not everybody has a greenhouse. So if you have a very light porch that could work maybe a carport that gets some sunlight, anything along those lines. And what happens is it causes the skin of the squash or pumpkins to really harden. And that means they will keep in storage for probably longer than you thought possible. I have actually kept winter squash and pumpkins in storage for a year and they're still good, which I think is pretty amazing. Now, while I'm on the subject of winter squash, I wanted to give you a quick update on the burpees butterbush butternut squash that I'm growing for the first time this year. This is one that grows on a more petite kind of a plant rather than a long vine. It needs much fewer days to reach maturity than regular butternut squash. If you're like me, you love roasted butternut squash for all kinds of things. So I've been very excited about them. I have two plants and seven squash all together. So here are a couple of them. And once again, I would be looking at the color to see if it's ripe. And I see this green stripe in here. So very suspicious that it's not. There's a green stem. If I press my thumbnail into here, you know, it does make a bit of a dent. So I know that it's not ripe. I'm not in a huge hurry to harvest it, but very excited to see how it is when it's been roasted. And I've got one more squash story to tell you, and this is kind of weird. So this plant is a Cocozel zucchini plant. We have grown this variety for a few years. We love it. I had two plants because I tried to have a little restraint knowing how much zucchini plants produce. A couple of weeks back, we were noticing that there were no flowers. It hadn't been producing for a while. And so Bill was saying, you know, I think we should just pull them up because I think they're done for the season. But it was really weird for it to do that. And again, we've had heat, we've had drought, so I'm not surprised. But anyway, so I pulled out one of the plants and then I thought, well, I'm just going to leave this one in the bed. That's what all of this is here. And I came out yesterday and there's four zucchinis on it. <laughs> so yeah, it wasn't ready to call it a season. 
So, you know, don't give up on your zucchinis if they take a little bit of a break in producing. Generally speaking, I've always had them produce right up to frost. So uh, I think I'll just leave them in place. And as a matter of fact, I'm making a zucchini dish tonight. So I've got some zucchinis to use. This is one of our corn beds. And we harvested the ears of corn from this bed about two weeks ago. They were fabulous. And if your corn is finished, you know there's two things that you can do with the corn stalks. First of all, you can harvest the stalks and put them somewhere that they can dry, tie them together, and you can use them for fall decorations, like on your front porch or something. The other thing you can do, especially if you have a whole lot of them, is you can either run these through a chipper shredder if you have one, or you can run your lawnmower over a few at a time and add that to your compost pile because that is a great compost builder. I thought you might enjoy these zinnias. Aren't they pretty? Thanks so much for watching today, everybody. Happy gardening.